104.1 River West Radio. My name is Kyle, and joining me from sunny Los Angeles, California, with a tummy ache, is my co-host, Big Chris. What's up, Chris? Well, you already, you know, you already told all the listeners what's going on. Dude, it's been a, you know, yeah, my stomach hurts. Uh, I think I stepped on a shard of glass from last night. That was not from my accident outside, but I accidentally broke a glass the other day. We have a very special guest. Uh, this man is a basketball legend from Fall River, Massachusetts. He scored over 2,000 points in his high school career and was a 1994 McDonald's All-American. He played two seasons in the NBA and overseas for seven years. Uh, you know, he lost his career due to drug addiction, but through the grace of God, he kept his life and his family. Uh, since 2009, he's spoken to over one million students, athletes, and community members all over the U.S. about substance abuse and wellness. Uh, his recovery journey has been documented in the best-selling memoir, Basketball Junkie, uh, the Emmy-nominated ESPN Films documentary, Unguarded, and in countless local, national, and international stories by the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Sports Illustrated. Uh, he founded the Heron Project in 2011. 2018, he founded Heron Wellness, which is a residential health and wellness program that helps guests lead healthy, substance-free lives. Uh, judging from recent footage I've seen of him, he looks like he could still play some basketball. For sure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chris Aaron, how are you today, Chris? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. It's, uh, you know, I'm always, I'm always a little uncomfortable with the word basketball legend, right? Because, you know, right after that, it's played two years in the NBA. I, uh, you know, my, my basketball career was, was extremely short because of my substance use. Um, but it's a career that I'm very grateful for because it's given me a platform to, to really open up discussion and, and kind of break down the stigma around drug use, around addiction. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, for starters, well, for one, I mean, come on, you are definitely a basketball legend. Mm. Don't sell yourself short there. Yeah. Can I add yeah, to that? I Sorry. Yeah, sure. Weren't you also like a Gatorade player of the year as well? Yeah, no, listen, I, I, I was, uh, I was, I definitely came on the scene pretty strong when I, you know, when I was a junior, you know, I won the national championship three years in a row in AAU. Um, and that was back when AAU basketball all came under the same roof. It wasn't uh -huh. Adidas, Nike, Under Armour. So the best of the best came to the same building. Um, but, but to, to be a McDonald's All American and, and, and Gatorade Player of the Year and, you know, go on to, you know, have a successful college career as well. Um, you know, but all the while kind of battling early stages of, of addiction. And, you know, it's funny cause, cause when I talk about, when I talk about it, it's, it's, you know, it's okay for me to stay now at 14 years sober, but, um, you know, when you live that life and, and the picture is painted, and you know behind that picture at any second it's going to be gone. Um, you know, it's a tough way to live. Yeah, no, and, uh, Yeah, Yeah, but, I mean, uh, sober since August 1st, 2008. So 14 yeah. and a half years sober, going on 15. Uh, congratulations. And um, I actually have a funny story for you, Chris. So back in late 2011, a little after your ESPN documentary Unguarded came out, I actually got to do – um, an hour long phone interview with you for one of my college classes. So I just yeah, reached out awesome. via email asking to talk to you and you were kind enough to say yes. I actually listened back to it the other day and I mean, for one, you and I crushed it, obviously. But, uh, mm -hmm. I really wished I had listened to some of the things you were saying back then. I mean, I'm 34 mm. now and since, and since college, I've wasted a lot of time on drugs and alcohol, you know, ruined relationships, burned bridges. Threw away good things, all that good shit that <laughs> people go through. I think I finally got a hold on the person I want to be, but I got to say that your story is, like, so inspirational. Um, It's pretty wild to me that here we are, like, over 12 years later, talking again right now, I guess. How much did your yeah. did that ESPN documentary change your life? Oh, gosh, it changed my life tremendously, right? Like, I mean, I had no intention. The backstory of Unguarded is Unguarded initially – was the majority of the film was going to be filming me working in a basketball gym with young kids and like rebuilding my life through recovery and through these children in a basketball gym. And, you know, John Hawk, the director, uh, 
I got a phone call to fly somewhere to speak. And he's like, Hey, do you mind if I come with you? And it was, it was, you know, I was extremely new at it. And he came and he said, you know what, Chris, I think we have to change the whole direction of this documentary. Like I really want to focus on you telling your story. So we've kind of pivoted and we went in a completely different direction. And, you know, I was unaware of the impact it would have on my life and, and the impact it would have on my children's lives. But, um, the goal of that documentary for me and for my wife was to get it in the hands of people who struggle. And, you know, I think we've accomplished that goal. I think, you know, most treatment centers, uh, in America, you know, play unguarded. So anybody who's in early stages of recovery or even in their addiction, um, you know, they can reference unguarded somewhat. So that's what the, that's what the goal was. That's what the mission was. And, and I think we've exceeded that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that, you know, giving people the ability, giving, I don't want to use the word commoner, but you know, uh, you know, someone living an everyday life that's struggling with addiction to see someone that honestly is at the pinnacle of success in a sense, you know, to see that they have their own demons and, you know, struggles and, the downfalls that come with it kind of gives them a, a sense of hope in a way Like this can happen to anybody. This isn't just like my problem. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a good thing that, you know, that, that, that came out that you were willing to uh, share a lot of uh, personal uh, private moments of your life. Yeah. You know, it's um, again, there weren't a lot of documentaries on heroin. Right. So it was it was, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I was the first, but I was part of the process of kind of putting this out there and, and allowing people to understand that, you know, you're not alone in it. Right. And and absolutely, I was at the pinnacle, but my addiction kept me at the bottom much longer than the pinnacle. Um, and I just wanted people to see that, you know, like. I went from playing in the NBA to having no heat, no lights, no electricity, you know, like living that life, um, you know, taking and stealing from everybody who loved me. And it's, uh, you know, that, that world is, is, is very unkind. It's unforgiving. And I lived in it for a while. And I just wanted people to know that, you know, no matter how long you live there, right. There's an option, you know, there's, there's possibility. And, you know, 14 years sober, man, that's the greatest accomplishment of my life. You know, I did the, the Pat McAfee show, you know, six months ago, and I said for the first time, and and out of all the speaking engagements I've done in my career, thousands of them, um, I never said it, but it hit me that day that, you know, my whole life I've been wired. I'm just wired to, to really seek relief, right? Like Like, for some reason, my brain tells me this to go after it to get relief and you know for, for for a guy like me you know 14 and a half years sober and and have gone the last 14 and a half years without that type of relief has been you know just monumental yeah nothing short of remarkable you know you talked a lot about and i watched that interview back uh that was a good mm-hmm. one i mean you've done a lot you've done a lot of good ones but yeah you you being on pat that was a really good one are you still uh, whipping kids' asses at tennis, like you said? Yeah. I mean, right now, you know, it's not the season. In the summertime at my place, like, I, I, I definitely bring it, right, like doubles. I'm a huge doubles person with tennis. Um, you know, I'm a gorilla on the tennis court. You know, I'm, 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 I'm big, I'm athletic, and, 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 uh, and I'm aggressive, which is not tip- your typical tennis player. <laughs> Are you talking shit the whole time too? You gotta be, right? <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's uh, listen, it's it's a competition is a big part of in my. It's been a, always been a big part of my life, but it's also a big part of my recovery. You know, like it it it, it gets me it gets me going. It gets my heart beating, and you know, I'm sober to enjoy those moments. I'm sober to to put myself in those situations and. Um, you know, basketball is not my sport. It hasn't been for a long time. Um, and, and again, the toughness of tennis, right. And the toughness of boxing and UFC, like the fact that you can't look 
to your coach to say, I'm off today, pull me out. Like, like I got the utmost respect for those people, you know, for runners, any and golfers, tennis, boxing, yeah. UFC. Like when you can't get subbed out on a bad day and your bad yeah, day sucks. is glaring. <laughs> yeah, man, that's big time. And, um, don't want to speak out of turn here, Chris, but my co-host Christian, uh, he's a recovering heroin addict. So I think, mm. um, Chris, if you want to share your experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I remember, I remember watching Unguarded came out, I believe 2011. So I was a, mm. uh, a sophomore in high school. And by that time I was already like snorting oxys, like off textbooks in the bathroom. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I got hooked on heroin through a coworker and by the age of like 16 was doing that for it's always the friends. It's always yeah. the friends that hook you up, right? I lost my virginity to her too. So at least I got something out of it. But, um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that was four years of my life that, you know, never get back in just, I mean, the, number one, you know, I, I don't even feel bad for myself for it. I, I feel bad for my family. I feel bad for my mom. Cool. You know, the, the shit I put her through, put her, yeah, put her through, you know, stealing and just, you know, I'm her only kid. So, um, yeah, yeah I mean, it, that's, that's, you know, that's a baby, right? Like, I don't know if I would have been able to survive that world at 16. You know, that world is, is dark, right? It's, it's that world, as I said, it's unforgiving people. It's the most selfish, self-centered, um, world that I've ever been a part of. And, you know, 16 years old to go through that is, is amazing. And, you know, I remember when I first started going to meetings, man, like 14 years ago, I, I didn't, I didn't hear a lot of heroin stories, right? Like I, there weren't a lot of people showing up saying I've been sober from shooting heroin for 10, 20, 30 years. I just didn't hear them, you know? So, so when I started meeting people that kind of went through what I went through and can identify with me and I can identify with them, um, you know, I, I started I started the process of forgiving myself. But when I see kids come into my wellness center, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, who who were struggling with heroin addiction, man, I have the utmost compassion, empathy, and respect to not only them but their family because I know exactly, you know, what that feels like on both sides, right? Like my dad's an alcoholic. I grew up in the, as a child in a house of an alcoholic. Um and, you know, I can identify with both sides, but the fact that you battled that at such a young age, man, you're a, you're a warrior. Hell yeah, Chris, you are a warrior. I, I appreciate you that. Did, you didn't hear that today. You need to hear that. But, um, so yeah. Chris, it seems like it takes, it takes a certain type of person to be able to take in other people's sorrow and their struggle. And you've, you've told your story to so many people all over the U S and you've helped so many people, but how do you take care of yourself? I guess when it comes to not letting what you absorb from others hurt you and your recovery, because I mean, yeah, there's the inspiration and there's like the heartwarming moments, but like, what about, you know, the sad, the sad ones? Like, how are you dealing with that? You had. It's, it's, it comes in waves to be honest with you, brother. If I'm being honest, like, you know, there's days I don't take care of myself, right? There's days that I just want to, I, I kind of want to isolate from the world. There's days I want to put that little latch over my hotel room door and say, do not disturb me. Right. Like right. that's, 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 again, that's how I'm wired. Right. Like when I talk to kids, when I talk to people, like I think this has a whole lot to do with self-esteem, self-worth, trauma, family. There's so many other aspects to addiction that really go unnoticed or not discussed enough. Um, and you know, there's days 14 years sober, there's days I can't stand myself, man. You know, there's, there's yeah. periods of my, there's periods of my life, you know, where I'm training for a marathon and I'm playing tennis and I'm eating good. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm, um 265 pounds and I'm eating horrible and I'm not exercising. You know, it's just, it, it, it goes in waves for me. And I just have to be, I have to have people around me that, have the ability to say, yo, like, pick your, pick your shit up, man, because it's not looking right, you know? And, and, I, and I've been fortunate to have those people in my life. Yeah. Do you, um, and you talked a lot about how you felt when you were growing up and not feeling comfortable in your own skin, not being able to be happy with who you were. 
who you are. I mean, I know, like, growing up, I just, I've definitely felt that, felt like an alien at times, or just felt different than other people. So I guess, do you remember, like, when those feelings started for you? Probably when I was old enough to understand the dysfunction of my parents' marriage. Right? When, when, when all of a sudden life wasn't balanced anymore. And right. that's probably six, seven years old. Right? Like, what's going to happen today? How, how, how's the next couple of weeks going to be? Um, and, you know, when you're intertwined with two adults that are completely dysfunctional and your father's drinking and their marriage is falling apart and, you know, and everything that comes with that, uh, you just get dragged. Right. And I was dragged. Um, and, and again, like I, and I, and I think it's important to say because that release thing, right? Like, I don't care what anybody says, man. Like, that's in my brain. Like, I'm wired to seek relief. And, you know, whether 14 years sober, two weeks sober, you know, there's something that's going to creep into my head to say, you could feel better if you did this. And, you know, since I was a little kid, I love changing myself, man. I just loved being somebody else. I loved going in the driveway and pretending to be Larry Bird and, you know, and, and, and fight him, whatever it is. Right. And then as I got older, I found drugs and alcohol that can take me away. Um, and that started probably, you know, around 12, 13 years old. And, and I, and I say this to kids all the time because I believe it's relevant is that I hated Miller Lite and I still hate him to be quite honest with you because of, 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 of what it did to my dad. Right. right. Like I hate Miller Lite. I hated Miller Lite as a child. I hated seeing him in the fridge. I hated seeing him in, in his hands. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, we're from Milwaukee. Yeah. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> but listen, the reality is the damage Miller Lite did to me as a child was real. And right. I started drinking him as, and I started drinking Miller Lite as a child, you know, and, and, and again, it's, it's how come I didn't have an adult in my life come up to me and say, Christopher, man, your family's falling apart. Your dad's alcoholism is, is completely, completely affecting your world and your family. And now you're going to drink his beer, um, yeah. you know, at, at 13 years old. Uh, and that's sad, right? There's a lot of sadness to that, that, that wasn't recognized and it wasn't identified. And, and, you know, that's why I do what I do today with kids because, when it comes to addiction, right, it's always, you know, let's tell kids how bad it is in the end rather than why it's beginning. Yeah. Like every kid in his brain today thinks of an addict and thinks of the worst possible scenario. Nobody talks about the first day. Um, and it, until, until we recognize the first day, until we show the whole spectrum of how addiction works, you know, that, that, that 15 year old kid who's in a bathroom, you know, who hasn't stolen yet, who hasn't robbed his mother yet, whose mother doesn't even know yet, and he's banging lines of Oxycontin off a textbook. No offense, know, that, Christian. That kid, yeah, but that kid needs to be, re that kid needs to be recognized. Like that stage yeah. of his life needs to be recognized. And oftentimes it's forgotten when it comes to addiction. Yeah, definitely. And I know, like, for me, yeah, the first time I drank, like it was end of the year after went over to Val Meskel's house after my eighth grade end of the year dance, first time drinking. And I know I knew immediately as soon as I like felt it, I was like, this is awesome. And from there, I mean, it just definitely created this unhealthy relationship with substances. It was definitely an escape. I still don't know what exactly it is that I was escaping from. But, yeah, it was the feeling of just getting to be someone else or feel different. And you know, it's a mess. Yeah, I guess I, in my opinion, right? It's, 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 there's, there's, there's people who escape with it and there's people that use it as a mask. And I think there's a lot of kids out there that can identify with alcohol, marijuana, you know, those early stages, those early substances as it's their mask. You know, it's the masquerade that they're putting on, on a Friday night out in the woods with their friends or down in the basement with their buddies. It, you know, I, I just, I mean, you, you say that, but um, could no one tell when you were playing, like back in college, back in the, you know, the NBA, you know, you're playing under Patino, you're playing under the legendary Jerry Tarkanian, no one, I mean, you were, you were putting up 17 points per game, 
high. Uh, from yeah. what I, from what yeah, I'm like, like and like Pat McAfee said, you must be one of the best athletes of all time, just being fully functional out there. <laughs> yeah, right. I uh, listen. I think everybody knew. I was completely wild in college. You know, like I could never or would never survive today. Um, you know, with social media and cell phones, like yeah. I was, I was off the rails. Like you could find me at seven o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday in the toughest hood with the toughest yeah. gangsters in, in all of Fresno, you know, like that's, that's where I ended up that night. I, I, I ended up in places that my teammates, you know, we got to a certain time at a party or at a club they knew that they had to go because they did not want to fall into the trap of ending up with me and, and the people <laughs> in the places that I ended up. Um, yeah, but, it is, cra- it is you know, crazy where you end up on those late nights, right? <laughs> uh, it's awful. It's awful. And, 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 you know, listen, they had an idea, right? But again, it's kind of early. And, and that's why I, I can't stand the word rock bottom. Like, I hate that word because I believe it, it, it blocks. I believe it gets in the way of families intervening early. I, you know, for some horrible, horrible reason, people think that you have to lose everything in life and burn every bridge and burn every relationship to get, to get it back. And, you know, I witness that every day here at my wellness center. I witness people their their low is so much higher than than I ever was and and they turn their right. life around you know and they spare the people who love them they spare the relationships they spare their education and you know like early intervention is critical in this and you know nobody wanted to intervene early i was just kind of that wild child i was that kid in college who was just wild doing his thing and i I, I became that kind of character. And you were just really fucking good at basketball, too. That probably helps people what? turn the, turn the eye the other way when, I mean, you're out there performing. I hate to say that, I mean, athletes in general, but, yeah, there's obviously a lot more leeway when you're performing, yeah, right? It's no easy. Doubt, but, 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 and I say this, too, and it's, um, I believe I really performed at a high level because I was so afraid to fail and, and my addiction come out into the light. Right. Like, like that, I, I, honest to God, I believe that my addiction and the fear of, of being exposed drove me to be, to have the success that I had. Now, obviously it's not sustainable, right? But I believe that fear when I was 19 years old, 20 years old in college, that that drove me like I, I you know pulling up into like walking into that arena against texas and drinking in the parking lot and being with two girls i don't even know who they are to this day i couldn't tell you who they were and smoking cigarettes and, and drinking beers and you know i'm still i'm still you know my heart rate is is seen through my shirt and um you know i walked in there and i part of me says like listen like you better do something because right. if you don't, you're going to be exposed on CBS, on national TV today. Um, and I believe that played a big part in my success. It's just crazy how it works where, like, you have these things like, yeah, I don't want to fuck up on national TV. And yet you have all these reasons why you shouldn't be doing something. And it's like you're still doing sure. it, right? <laughs> yeah. Is, is any of it a blur to you? Like, are there any years playing basketball that you don't remember, like, say, for – when you were overseas and, you know, I, I believe uh, it was in Italy that you first started using like actual heroin, like, or even before that, you know, you said you would drinking before a game. Like, do you even remember yeah. some of those moments? My college is more of a college. My college years are more of a blur. Yeah. You know, the NBA was short lived. Like I remember because I was in early, like I had just jumped on oxys. So that world was like so different and like, I just remember the pain of trying to survive in that world and, and the, the, the panic of trying to hide it. Um, you know, overseas, I remember, you know, gosh, I mean, I remember my drug dealer's name, you know, overseas. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's, I, I got pictures, I got pictures 
you know, of with me with them, um, you know, in Tiananmen Square, you know, like here he is, like he's my buddy and, and really he's my drug dealer. Um, right. But, you know, so my college is, I would say, is more of a blur than anything. Okay, well, let me ask you this, you know, because, I mean, we I, I feel like we've, you know, kind of talking about the low points. What were the high points of both your life and your career besides besides getting sober, which is a, you know, tremendous accomplishment in the birth of your kids, uh, you know, your marriage? What what would you say are just like high points of your life? Probably one of the highest points of my life is probably meeting Bill Reynolds, right, who wrote my the book on me when I was 16. You know, okay. like that, 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 that him walking into my life, into my world at 16 years old, you know, had such a tremendous, tremendous impact on me. Um, but the reality is my, my world was basketball, right? From sixth grade on, that's all I did. Um, I, I played hoop and I partied and that was, that was kind of my world. Um, but you know, you guys obviously in recovery, it's, you know, People don't understand what it's like to see recovery, to see sobriety in the people that love you in their eyes. And when I saw sobriety in my children's eyes, like when they looked at me and I knew that my sobriety has given them something, that's the highest point. I will never attain a higher point in my life. You know, when, when, when the people who you love and they love you, when you see your world kind of entering into their world and you see in their eyes that they're at peace, I say it to the people in my center all the time. Like, you know, you walk around my house, man. And, you know, Christopher was 10 when I got sober. So we got 10 years of pictures and I see it in his eyes from zero to 10. I see my addiction. He's wearing it. And then right. you see the pictures post addiction in recovery and, you know, the smiling, you know, the way they look is just drastically different. And I don't think I'll ever, ever reach a higher point than that. Yeah. And I mean, that's so much to be proud of. Uh, did your son, your Chris, Chris Harris Jr. So he played basketball for a while. Then he tried walking on as a football player at Alabama. Did he end up making it? Oh, yeah. No, no doubt. He, um, you know, I'm so close with Saban, right? He's one of the best men that I've ever met um, in sports, for sure. Um, but, you know, I've been working directly with Alabama for like 12, 13 years. Um, oh, yeah. With the football team and going down there and, and, and working with guys individually and in groups and telling my story. Um, and, you know... Uh, one of the great moments of my life is when my son told me he wanted to get out of basketball. You know, like I, I, I felt so accomplished as a father that he called me with that. Um, and, you know, a couple of months after, he's like, you know, I want to try football. Like, and I said, Coach Saban wants you to come and, you know, do summer workouts and get in on seven on sevens and see how it feels. And he did it and he loved it. Um, so we did one season, and he got out of there. I mean, that's an accomplishment. I mean, Alabama football. I, I mean, we want to yeah, talk not about bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it. You know, again, I think the accomplishment is too is is being able to get through that process, right? Like, he's Coach Saban is who he is because you know he's created this process and this culture there, and the professionalism the accountability, you know, what these young kids have to take on. Football is a different animal, you know, like sure. football players have it tough in college. You know, I, I thought I had it tough practicing two and a half hours a day. Football players dedicate all day um, and then have to balance their schoolwork. Um, and you would, and I remember you saying that you felt like obviously it was easier. The sport that you're like involved in, I mean, basketball gave you a lot of free time in comparison to if you'd been a, a football player, you know, their days are so structured and whatnot. And there's just so much more that you have to give to be a part of it. So it seems like obviously structure uh, did you well, more structure would have helped. Like I know that uh, the lack of structure in my life is usually what leads to my downfall. Um, 
So what about for you? I mean, you know, after your fourth overdose, you were leaving the hospital, you were ready to kill yourself, and a nurse stopped you, begging you to stay because she had gone to high school with your mom, and she had said that she could hear your mom talking to her right then and there to pleading with her to keep you at the hospital. I mean, that's very powerful, and I'm still trying to figure out if we're all in control of our own destiny, if there's a plan that's already set in place for everybody. But, like, what about you? Do you think there's been some divine intervention in your life? Oh, multiple. Yeah, yeah, multiple divine interventions. I mean, listen, that nurse will be, you know, I have have a picture of her in my phone. Um, You know, what she did for me that day is, is, nothing short of a miracle, right? Like I am who I am today. I've, I've gotten to this point today, you know, because of her, um, you know, but there's also Mary in an NA meeting on Cape Cod that put me in this spot. And then there's Bill who, you know, taught me how to be a dad again at 12 months, so at a year sober. So, you know, there's been multiple people in my life that have been put in it and, and changed the course of my life. Um, and, you know, to be quite frank, I mean, that's why I started Heron Project, right? Like, I wanted to be somebody's, I wanted to be the nurse in somebody's life. I wanted to be Chris Mullen, you know, who found that center for me, you know, that he saw on TV that I was struggling, and he said with his wife, like, let's let's try to help this kid. And, right. you know, I don't think I'd be alive today if it wasn't for the Mullen family. And I wanted to do that. I felt... I felt a strong obligation and and a pull that, you know, I need to give that back. And Heron Project started over a decade ago. And, you know, I don't know the exact number, but I believe we're we're close to 3,000 people that we've put into treatment. Um, You know, we've given given away about $8 million of scholarships in the last decade. Um, Yeah, so, you know, I, I laid in bed at night in early recovery saying to myself, you know, you've got to be that person once you get sober. And, you know, it's been, it's been a beautiful process. Hey, yeah. It's, you know, like the, like the Saban coaching tree, you know, by you helping out 3,000 people, they, you know, a couple of them might help a couple people and then 3,000 more and 3,000 more. So even that yeah. long after we're gone, it's just a continuing, you know, door, yeah. revolving door. So. Paying it forward, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to, right? Like, come on, man. Like what, what, what recovery has given me and my family, right? Like why wouldn't you want to share that with other people? Why wouldn't you want other people to feel it? Right. But like 14 years ago, the stigma of heroin addiction, you were done. Whether like, I truly believe like I, why get sober? My life is over. Like, right. I can't, I'm, I'm 32 years old, man. I don't have a degree. I played college basketball for five years. I never graduated. All I know is basketball and drugs. And now I'm going to get sober. And and what am I going to do with my life? You know, so the the stigma of heroin, you know, the narrative in my head was like, don't even bother because there's nothing to look forward to. And, you know, obviously I was, I was, I was wrong, right? Like, I started living again, man. Like I started seeing things, you know, the way they should be seen and, and doing things the way they're supposed to be done. And, you know, it's, uh, I don't care what anybody says, man. Like I don't judge people who drink. I don't judge people who do drugs. There's no doubt about that. But I, I know one thing, once I removed those two things out of my life, I became better at every facet of my life. Yeah, definitely. And uh, on a lighter note, I like what you said to Pat when you did an interview with him, where you said you've essentially been married twice since uh, yeah. post, oh, po- yeah. post 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 cleaning up and pre cleaning up. So I imagine that your wife likes this new version of you a lot better. Yeah, totally, totally. Listen, I, I got a buddy who of mine who's a police officer, and I was probably like 11 years sober, and he decided to dig into my mug shot. And oh, you know, he he <laughs> he sent me my mug shots and. My first reaction was I made my wife so sick that she stayed with that. You know, like wow. that's how that that's how low we all were, right? Because it was just I I I know what I look like, right? But you know, the fact that my children had to see me in like like that, and my wife had to see me like that and and people who cared about me, um you know, that's tough. 
right? And I keep those mug shots, man. They, they're very close to me, and I share them with people in early recovery. Like, this is what, this is the beginning. And, uh, you know, I've been married, right, coming up on 25 years. So, you know, we've been, it will be essentially 15 years in recovery and 10 years in addiction, and, and it's two different animals, two different, you know, two different people. Yeah. You guys can beat you guys can beat anything though at this point, right? I hope so, right? Like, you know, that's there's no doubt about that. I mean, listen, recovery's not easy to navigate either. Right? Like there's it's 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 all a process. Everybody sometimes people think like, Oh, you got sober, your life is, is great now. Right? Like no. life can, <laughs> right. Yeah, life can be low, man. Like that's again, that's who you know, we we, we became addicted because of you know, there's, 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 there's reason. And because of, those, yeah, because of how you felt soberly already. <laughs> totally, totally. So th- they're not going away. Like they're going to be there. They're going to present themselves throughout the process. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the easiest guy to get along with. Sometimes I'm competitive as a mother. And, you know, my wife, I torture her sometimes with, with, with that stuff. And, uh, but, Coming up on 25 years sober is just an amazing, I mean, 25 years married is just an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Yeah. How's, uh, how are all your kids? I mean, obviously your youngest kids, um, well, I mean, your, your oldest or your young, your youngest kid was basically you've been sober for the entirety of his whole life. Of, of yeah. his whole life. And your two others, I mean, does, does time heal all wounds? I mean, the person you are now, there's, you've had so much of that past life is put behind you. So I mean, where would you say your relationship with your children? I mean, you're 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 their oh, dad. My, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the dad that I've always wanted to be, right? And the dad that they needed. But you know, I'll tell you this, right? Like, you know, when you get into recovery and they say, like, you know, step four, step five, you know, and you and you and you 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 write it out and you work on making amends. Um, when you get to the amends step, you know, like I. I made I made verbal amends to a lot of people, um, but I also kind of stayed behind letting my my action be an amends, right? Like how I'm living my life in sobriety. That that's kind of a living amends. And Christopher, you know, we were in the kitchen a few months ago, and you know, we're all just chilling and he responded to something and I saw myself in that response and it wasn't, it it wasn't pretty, right? It wasn't pretty. It wasn't something as a father to be proud of. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't anything major and it, it wouldn't hit anyone the way it hit me if they were there. But at that moment, you know, I walked up to him and I put my forehead on his forehead and, and I said, you know, I hope you know, you know, how sorry I am. And that was 14 years of him not hearing that. Right. You know, like. Or hearing it and it didn't sorry. mean anything. Right. Yeah, but I said it, I said it, in, the first time I said it to him was that 14 years sober, right? Like, I know my son right. knows I'm sorry. I know he knows that I have a ton of guilt and regret. But when I said sorry to him in my kitchen, forehead to forehead in front of my wife, um, him and I could have cried for three weeks. Like, that's how raw and yeah. powerful that moment was. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I know... We've taken a chunk of your time here, and I, I mean, I just want to say, like I said, it's it's amazing what you've done. You've, uh, I hope you know just how impo- like the impact you've had on so many people. I mean, you are definitely making up for all the time that you've lost. And um, yeah, Chris mm. and I, we couldn't thank you enough for being on. I know you got some kids that beat up on the tennis courts right now, yell at whatever <laughs> you got to do. I can, we can let you get back to it, but um, we appreciate your time, man. Yeah, no doubt, brother. I appreciate you guys, right? I mean, we're in this together. That's the reality. You know, we, like I say all the time, like, there's nothing better. It's, it's when two people who suffered the way we've suffered, when we connect, right? Because there's no judgment 
and there's only happiness and like sharing that pain and knowing where that person has come, come from and where he's going. Um, you know, so this program is about us, right? It's about we, it's not I. And, and without, without the newcomer, without the old timer, you know, it's, uh, I'm lost. And so thank you for sharing your, your story with me. And, and, you know, the fact that we did this 12 years ago kind of blows my mind. Isn't it? It's crazy. Um, I can know, send you. I can send you the old the, yeah. <laughs> the clip, clip if you want. But um, I mean the message. The message just stays the same. Yeah. Um. Just keep on fighting. I guess it gets easier, right? But you got to do it every day. That's the hard part. way to explain or say how painful the hangover was today in front of the toilet hands and knees trying to breathe in between the dry heaves my baby made me some coffee afraid that if i drink some it's probably coming right back out me a couple of advil relax and chill at a standstill with how bad i feel i think i need to smell fresh air so i stepped out the back door and fell down the stairs the sunlight hit me dead in the eye like it's mad that i gave half the day to last night my bad sight made me trip on my ass right into that patch of grass like that's life all of a sudden i realized something the weather is amazing even the birds are bumping stood up and took a look and a breath and there's that bike that i forgot that i possessed never really seen exercise as friendly but i think something's telling me to ride that 10 speed brakes are broken, that's alright, the tires got air and the chain seems tight, huh, hopped on, it felt the summertime, it reminds me of one of them moosab lines, like, sunshine, sunshine, it's fine, I feel it in my skin, warming up my mind, sometimes you gotta give in to win, I love the days when it shines, whoa, let it shine, sunshine, sunshine, it's fine, I feel it in my skin, warming up my mind, sometimes you gotta give in to win, I love the days when it shines, Whoa, let it shine Whoa, let it shine Whoa, let it shine Whoa, let it shine Whoa, let it If I could, I would keep this feeling in a plastic jar Bust it out whenever someone's acting hard Settle down, barbecue in the backyard The kids get treats and old folks get classic cars Every day that gets to pass is a success And every woman looks better in a sundress The sun shines an excuse to shoot hoops Get juice, show and prove them moves and let loose I hear voices, I see smiles to match them Good times and you can feel it in the fashion Even though the heat cooks up the action The streets still got butterflies, enough kids to catch them Riding my bike around these lakes, man Feeling like I finally figured out my escape plan Take it all in, the day started off all wrong But somehow now that hangover is all gone Ain't nothing like the sound of the leaves When the breeze penetrates these south side trees Leaning up against one, watching the vibe Forgetting all about the stress, thanking God I'm alive huh. It's so simple, I had to keep the song simple And when I get home, I'm gonna open all the windows Feeling alright, stopped at a stop sign A car pulled up, bumping fresh Prince of summertime Summer, summer, sign I feel it in my skin, warming up my mind Sometimes you gotta give in to win I love the days when it shines Whoa, let it shine Sunshine, sunshine, it's fine I feel it in my skin, warming up my mind Sometimes you gotta give in to win I love the days when it shines Whoa, let it shine Whoa, let it shine Whoa, let it shine Whoa, let it shine Whoa, let it shine